Good morning, church. Today's Bible reading is from Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 39. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 39. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come. Follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath day came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of law. Just then a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an impure spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with the sherek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this, a new teaching? And with authority, he even gives orders to impure spirit and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left, and she began to wait on him. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drew out many demons, but he could not let the demons speak because they knew who, the, who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus said, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for reading uh, that part of the Bible for us, Malkitha. So good. It's so good to have you with us. Uh, kia ora, everyone. My name's Dave, uh, and we're going to spend a bit of time exploring uh, this part of God's Word together uh, as we walk through it. Um, uh, if you are kind of newish with us or, or uh, kind of visiting today, then can I say especially warm welcome and shout out to those on the live stream. I'll just add my welcome to Rachel's. Uh, and if you are on the lookout for some sermon notes, we print uh, a copy of the kind of script of the, serv- of the sermon so that uh, people who are not as confident with uh, English can follow along. Uh, if you missed one of those we ran out this morning, I've just printed a couple more. If you'd like one of those, stick a hand up and I'll make sure you get one. Looks like everyone's good. Uh, You'll also um, find in the handout that you got as you came in the door, um, there's a space for sermon notes um, if you're a kind of note taker uh, for sermons. 
Uh, Let's pray together, uh, and then we'll jump into this part of Mark's gospel. Lord Jesus, thank you that you don't leave us to our own devices, that you speak. And you've spoken to us just as we've read your word today. So as we pick through these verses, as we explore them together, would you tell us about yourself? Help us to know you. Help us to know the love and hope and peace and joy found only in you. Help us to see clearly who you are and what that means for us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Act now before it is too late. Act now. (laughs) There's an urgency to these words, isn't there? An urgency which drives us to action, to do something. Act now before it is too late. That's the call that went out just a couple of weeks ago uh, from the Global Forum of Ethics of AI, or Artificial Intelligence. Now, as far as I can understand this article that I was reading, they weren't kind of sounding this blood-chilling scream, the robots are coming, watch out! Uh, That's maybe a few years away. Yet, what they were saying is this artificial intelligence, it it brings with it great power. And and, and just like with all things that that, that have within them great power, there's the power to do great good and the power to do great evil. And so they're saying we need to do more We need to do more than just kind of trust that commercial companies are going to do the right thing. But the same urgency from the same call, act now before it's too late, it's sounded over global warming, uh, over gender equality, over the COVID response, um, over your gut health, or maybe even curing baldness. Act now, they say, before it is too late. There's more, if my Google searches were anything to go by this week, because there's a point with these things, isn't there? There's a point of no return. It may be too late for this man here with his baldness. But today, Mark is trying to say right here in Mark's gospel, there is a point of no return. There's a warning that he wants to give us, and he wants us to feel the urgency of this point of no return. You see, last week we had this first introduction to who Jesus is. These multiple voices introducing us. Well, as Mark puts it, it's on the screen. Mark 1, chapter 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Today, we shift gear and we come face to face with this Jesus, this King. As Jesus' ministry, as Jesus begins his ministry, and as that happens, it's really quick fire as you walk through what happens in this passage we just read together, right? John is arrested. Jesus begins preaching about his kingdom. The first disciples are called. Unclean spirits, demons, they're cast out. The sick are healed. Authoritative teaching, it's marveled at. And then Jesus takes him off for a quiet, prayerful moment. There's a lot going on. But each scene in this storyline of Mark's gospel, each scene, it starts to fill in more, I hope you can see, more of the picture of who Jesus is. And he starts by showing us that Jesus has authority. Jesus has authority as God's king. Mark 1, 21, would you... Flick down and read with me. We're going to read a big chunk of it. Mark 1, 21. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impious spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed 
that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. Do you, do you see Jesus' authority? It's in his teaching. It's in his commands to the impure spirits. He, he commands them and they listen. Verse 25, he says, be quiet, come out. That's all Jesus needs to say, be quiet, come out. And an impure spirit, a, a spirit that has held this man hostage, he has overpowered him. Be quiet, come out. And the impure spirit is quiet, and he comes out. Amazing. And all through the scene of Mark's gospel, Jesus' authority as God's king, it's everywhere. He says to Simon and Andrew, to James and John, these brothers, he says, follow me. And they obey. Verse 18. Verse 18. What At once they left their nets and followed him. And then verse 20. Without delay, he called them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. See, this is Jesus' authority as God's king. He, he calls people and they cannot help but to follow him. He takes the hand of Simon's mother. You know, his mother and Simon's mother-in-law, she isn't feeling so great. Verse 31. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That's Jesus' authority as God's king. To lift people up out of sickness. And then the crowds come. The whole city is here, we're told, in verse 33. Let's read it together. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. That's Jesus' authority as God's king. But it raises the question for us. Is this the authority of your Jesus? To, to call people who can't help but follow him. To teach with authority. To command impure spirits who cannot help but obey. To lift people out of sickness and to heal those who suffer. To release those held captive by demons. Is this your Jesus or is your Jesus... Is he a little bit weak? But I think we can tell by what we pray for. How we ask Jesus to act in this world, to act in my life. As I pray, am I drawing from every bit of his authority? Am I asking him to call people to follow him? Am I asking him to undo the brokenness that I see all around me? To break the grip that Satan has over this city, this country, this world? Or are we praying for little things? An easy path at work, a comfortable house to live in, for the food that we already know we have in our pantry. As I've thought about it this week, this is a real challenge to my prayer life. What about you? Well, that's the authority that God has as king, and am I leaning into that in my prayer life? But as we move on, did you notice did you notice what's on Jesus' heart? People. As Jesus calls followers to enter his kingdom, disciples to enter his kingdom. That's his message in verses 14 and 15. Let's, let's read them together. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus' message to all who will hear him, it's simple, isn't it? The time is now. 
act now before it is too late. Because right now, God's kingdom is here. It's here because the king is here. Jesus is here. So now's the time to repent and believe. You see, and Jesus, he preaches this message, repent and believe. He calls people to follow him. He, he starts with Andrew, with Simon and Andrew, these brothers with James and John, to come and follow him, to join him in his ministry. And these brothers, Simon and Andrew, James and John, they're not coerced or forced into it. There's no hint of that in this passage. They see Jesus for who he is, and they can't help but follow him. But it comes at a cost, doesn't it? They're out fishing with their dad. They put down their nets. They leave their father, the security of the family business, and they follow Jesus. That's a cost. Have you done that? Because let me tell you, it's the best decision you can possibly make to follow Jesus. And then as followers of Jesus, to join with him in proclaiming his kingdom, his message. Repent and believe in the good news, in the gospel. But if we pause, we've got to reflect on that this is, this is an amazing reality, I hope you can see. It's an amazing privilege for Jesus to call anyone to follow him. He certainly isn't lonely. It's not like he kind of has this emptiness in his heart, and so he's like, oh, I'll take Dave, I'll take Dillis, they could be my friends. They'll fill this lonely spot. He's in perfect relationship within the Trinity with the Father and the Spirit. He also, he doesn't need help. It's not like he's like, oh, I've got this massive mission. I have to preach this mission, repent and believe to the whole world. How am I going to get that done? I'll ask Dave. No. He is God Almighty, isn't he? He's the one who speaks. He just speaks. And it happens. Later on in, in the gospel, we're going to hear him speak. And far away, someone is healed. Earlier, we reflected on the fact that in the beginning, he spoke and the whole world, all of creation came into being. He doesn't need my help. No, no, this is a privilege. I mean, that's not to mention the, the hundreds of armies of angels in heaven that just wait for his command he does not need my help and yet he wants me and you he invites us to follow him and to join him in his mission to know him to share his task of proclaiming the good news and did you notice how good God's kingdom is how good Jesus is kingdom is. Even this little first look that we get in this little passage that we've seen today, did you notice how good it is? That's why the best decision you can make is to drop everything and follow Jesus. Because sin, brokenness, and evil, they flee from him. That's what's happening here in Mark's gospel. Sin and brokenness and evil, they, they flee from him. As, in, as impure spirits are silent, and cast out as Simon's mother-in-law is healed. Mark doesn't tell us her name, but he does tell us her fever is gone and she gets up to serve them. Her illness, gone. This is what happens as the sick and the oppressed are healed as demons are cast out everywhere that Jesus goes. Sin and brokenness and evil flee from him because Jesus is perfect you see? He's holy. He's pure. He is God. So wherever God goes, wherever Jesus is, sin and brokenness and evil, they just flee from him. But we need to be careful here. I mean, does this mean that if I trust in Jesus, if I listen to his call to follow him, does that mean I'll be healed? That sickness it'll never be a problem for me. That anxiety and depression, that'll be a thing of the past. Does it mean I'll never suffer violence from what people do or say to me? Does that mean I'll be protected from the evil and brokenness 
of this world. Does it mean I'll be protected from spiritual attack? Well, I want to say, this is the promise that we have. It's a promise, but not now. It's for later. It's only for later when Jesus returns, when sin and brokenness and evil, they won't just flee from Jesus as he walks around in this world. They will be fully and finally dealt with. That's what we saw at the end of our rescue series last year as we looked at Revelation 21. In Revelation 21, the Apostle John, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And I heard a loud voice from the throne in this heaven saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That will all happen. It will all happen when Jesus returns, when all things are made new. It's a future that is guaranteed personally by God himself. And that means, that means when stuff gets hard, I can hold on to that. I can know that this suffering that I feel now won't last. Do you see? But also, we've got to remember that while we wait, we have a powerful saviour. A king who has authority over all things. And a thing who and a king who sometimes chooses to heal us now. And in amazing ways. That's why we should pray big prayers, not small ones. Knowing that he is the God who is able. That's why we can pray prayers like. Lord Jesus, please heal me. Take away the pain. Or even bigger prayers. Lord Jesus, save me from my sin, from certain death. Or save my friend, my parents, my brother, my colleague. That's a big prayer, the biggest of all miracles. But as we pray big prayers, particularly prayers that are about the end of sin, the end of brokenness, the end of evil now, we need to know that that promise that we have that is coming is not now. Lord Jesus, please heal me. Take away the pain. But if you don't, comfort me through the pain. Give me the strength to keep following you, Jesus, in the brokenness of this world. That's a beautiful prayer to pray now and a prayer that God loves to answer. Here's the thing. Sin and brokenness and evil, they flee from Jesus. They flee from him because of who he is, but that's not why he came. It's not why he came. Because Jesus' purpose, his mission is to preach the good news of God. That's what Mark says at the beginning and end of this section as kind of bookends. It's even straight off the lips of Jesus, what Jesus says himself, why he's come. Look with me at verse 14 again. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Remember John, we saw him, we met him last week. His role is one of a herald. He, he announces this King Jesus. He, he announces God himself in Jesus coming to his people. He, he's the one, do you remember? He said, someone greater than me is coming. And once his job is done, once, once John's job is done, once Jesus is here, he just kind of steps into the background, doesn't he? And leaves the center stage for Jesus. And as Jesus steps into that center stage, what does he do? He preaches the gospel. The good news. This message, Mark summarizes off the lips of Jesus in verse 15. This is Jesus' message. This is the good news. What is it? The time has come 
time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And then again, if you flick to the end of what we read today, verse 38, Jesus replied, and he tells us why he's come. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Jesus' purpose is his mission. It's to preach the good news of God, which means that the sin and brokenness and evil that flee from him, that isn't core. It's more of a side effect as he goes from place to place preaching his message. It's an added bonus. But if Jesus' purpose, if his mission is to preach the good news, then the question is simple for us, isn't it? It's simple. It's, will I listen? Will I listen to his message? Will I listen to this good news? And more than listening and going, yep, understand, will we follow it? Will we repent and believe the good news? You see, repent, you hear it all the time in churches, right? Repent just means to stop and to turn around. It means we're walking in a certain direction. Repent means to stop and to turn around and to go the other way. Jesus is telling us to stop living as if we're the king, to stop rejecting him, to stop ignoring what he Says, You see, throughout the Bible, we're presented with this life, the life of rejecting Jesus, life rejecting the God who made us. It's called sin. It's less about the individual things. It's more about who is the king. And instead of living under God's role with him as our king, as this picture has on the screen, the way that things were designed to be with us ruling over creation under his kingship. Well, all of us have a problem because we love being the king or queen, don't we? We love it. And what we've done is we've taken the crown off Jesus and put it on our own heads. But we're not the king. We're not the queen, are we? We're not them. Because we were made by someone. Even now, as we sit here or stand here today, we're being sustained by Jesus. That means that we're a subject of him. Not a sovereign, not a king, not a queen. That king, his name is Jesus. And he's come with a clear purpose to tell us, sitting here in Mount Roscoe Baptist Church today, to repent and believe in the good news, to turn around, and instead of running full tilt away from him, to turn around and walk towards him instead. To know that he loves you. To believe in him, to trust him, to save you, to trust him to be your king. If you've never done that, if you've never sat down and prayed, Jesus, sorry for not living with you as my king. Forgive me, please. Help me to live with you as my king. Why not today? Why not today? Or come to the life course that Rachel mentioned and ask the questions of who is this king? Who is this Jesus? Act now before it is too late. That's Mark's concern today as we read these words, as he continues to paint a picture of who Jesus is right at the heart of Jesus' message, repent and believe the good news. And if you've been following Jesus for a while, then for us it's a great reminder, isn't it, that the life of the Christian, the life for all who follow Jesus, is the life of repenting and believing daily repenting and believing. It's the life of joining Jesus on his mission. The problem is we've all bought into a lie. A lie that says you can have your faith, just keep it to yourself. Just keep it to yourself. That's a you thing. 
But if we've seen Jesus' authority here in Mark's gospel, if we've seen sin, brokenness, and evil flee from him, if we've seen his purpose to preach the good news, the good news of God in all places, and if we've seen the amazing privilege it is to join him, to follow him, to take up his mission, then that isn't for me to keep quietly to myself, is it? for us to join him in sharing with all who will listen. Let's pray and ask God to help us do just that. Father, we thank you for this message throughout Mark's gospel, this question that you keep raising for us. Who is this Jesus? Who do we say that he is? Father, today we've come face to face with your Messiah, the Lord Jesus. We've seen his authority as your king. We've watched him call followers to enter his kingdom and take up and share in his mission. We've seen sin and brokenness and evil flee from him. We've also seen his purpose to preach the good news. Father, today would you Help us by your spirit working powerfully in us to repent and believe, whether for the first time or another daily repenting and believing as we follow him. Father, as we journey through life, as we come before you in prayer, would you grow the size of our prayers as we lean into the authority that he has? Father, we ask that you would pour out your mercy. Jesus, we ask that you would save richly. That people in this community that you've placed us in would see our lives and would hear us talk about the Lord Jesus, would see his authority as a good king, would see his kingdom as a beautiful place, and would want to come and follow him. Would you give us words, feeble and broken as they are, but would, would you work through them? Father, we pray for the people of our church and in our community who are sick, who are feeling the brokenness of this world. And we ask that that brokenness would flee that you would heal them, that you would bring health. And Lord, if you choose not to do that in your wisdom, would you do what you promised to do, which is to help them to carry on, to know your love, to comfort them as they journey through the brokenness that this world has to offer. And would you help them to hold on to the glory of the life to come in the Lord Jesus? In his name we pray.